Station Houston, are you ready for the event? And station's ready. Houston ACR, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Houston ACR. How do you hear me? And I've got you loud and clear. Great. Please stand by for opening remarks. Greetings from 7,258 feet at the U.S. Air Force Academy, far, far below that of the Air National Space Station. This is Brigadier General Paul Moga, Commandant of Cadets. On behalf of USAFA senior leadership and the entire faculty and staff, thanks to you and the NASA team for taking the time to speak with our cadets. This is a remarkable opportunity for our future Airmen and Guardians. So with that, here's our first question. Hello, Colonel Shari. My name is Cadet First Class Thomas McLean from Blythewood, South Carolina. And my question is, what is one unexpected challenge or experience on the space station uh, that your training could not have prepared you for? Well, Thomas, I think uh, so very similar to military training, we do what's called a lot of PTT or partial task training, where we do lots of different pieces together. So like for spacewalks, for example, we do training in the pool. Uh, we do training on a zero G apparatus to, so you can kind of offload your weight in another building, but you never really do it all until you get to space. So I think the thing that you can't ever uh, completely experience is the, the weightlessness and then actually how your brain's gonna respond to that. So everyone responds a little differently and you can't quite train that on the ground. So for me, I think that was the most, uh, you know, it wasn't unexpected, but the most uh, surprising thing. Uh, I think what's the most amazing though is how quickly your brain does adapt to it and it eventually becomes something you naturally do just like breathing that you don't think about but uh, making that transition and doing doing things in, in zero g or microgravity uh, is probably the biggest thing or the biggest challenge that you can't really train on the ground hi sir i'm cadet first class courtney kirkpatrick from leesburg virginia and i was wondering if you could speak on the importance and impact of the international space station on the u.s military thank you Yeah, sure, uh, Courtney. So I think there's kind of two aspects of that. One, uh, you guys are in your MRAS classes are probably, if you haven't, you probably will eventually learn about, you know, the differences between hard and soft power. And so the space station is one of those elements of, of soft power. And so uh, we have many instruments of power, and uh, the military is one of those, but we also rely on the soft power piece. And so working with the coalition, working with international partners, and having those personal connections both at a country and personal level is something that's really important. Uh, I think the other piece is more, you know, maybe close at hand for Space Force and future guardians there graduating is the tech demo ability. So anything really in space that needs some kind of manual intervention, whether that's an experiment, whether it's research, if you need a person involved in that, that requires a space station. And so there's many uh, things that both the Air and Space Force are interested in, in in the space environment. And so we provide a platform for both technology demonstrations and research to continue that. Hello, I'm Cadet First Class Armin Grenier from Rancho Palos Verdes, California, and I was wondering about the experiments you perform on the International Space Station. As far as the actual process goes, are astronauts mostly just executing directions from the principal investigators and reporting results, or do you get to be a part of the experimental design, dialogue, and results analysis as well? Thank you for your time. Uh, that's a really insightful question, Harmont. I would say the standard military answer is it depends. And uh, so things that ha involve us, so human research, we absolutely are part of as we get briefed on them and have to sign up to be part of them and volunteer. And then we obviously see the results of those. The things that aren't human research, uh, sort of your fundamental science, it's sort of a mix. I'd say you're generally correct. Most of the time, we are the eyes and the ears for the scientists and the PIs and do the, the work for them. But on the ground, there's a lot of buildup to that. So for example, like the DNA sequencing I was doing earlier this week. I did that three times on the ground with the PI team to make sure I understood their goals and objectives and was getting the science right. And then for people who are really into a certain field, you can be part of the boarding process. Uh, it's rank ordered by the national science priorities, but you can be part of that process of both getting experiments on board and then also publishing after the fact. Hello, my name is Cadet 4th Class Brandon Anderson from Pensacola, Florida, and my question is, what is the greatest challenge facing NASA and private space companies as they continue to work towards sending people to Mars? 
Uh, hey, hey, Brandon, it's good to hear a, a Dooley talk, so I know at least they're feeding you guys, and uh, hopefully you guys will be recognized before I get back on Earth here this spring. But uh, I think two parts to that uh, answer. One is, the, you know, we're continuing to do human research. And Mark, who's up here with me now, Christina, who recently came back, we're both we're increasing our sample size of people who've been here longer than six months up in space. And the reason we're doing that is we want to see if there's is the progression of human change linear with months to years as we look at Mars? or is there a cliff? Like, does something happen at a year? Does something happen in 15 months? And we're trying to solve that problem. Uh, is that, you know, as we look at a Mars mission, we need to understand that. Uh, my personal opinion is the challenge is propulsion. And so for you uh, who are working on propulsion in the Astro Department or Aero or any, any department, um, if we can get there faster, that will solve the problem. Most of our problems, whether it's radiation, uh, human psychology, uh, water, consumables, getting there and back and living there, it's all because of takes so long to get there. So uh, if we could have a, you know, a quantum leap in propulsion technology, whether it's electric, whether it's nuclear propulsion, getting that to accept that politically and socially, I think that would solve a lot of our problems. Hello, I'm Cadet Third Class Jeremy Chen from Albuquerque, New Mexico. I know that the astronaut selection process is magnitudes more competitive than the Air Force Academy, and the selection process and training must have been incredibly intense. My question is, do you ever feel overwhelmed by it all, and how do you deal with these feelings? Thank you. So, Jeremy, uh, yeah, yeah, it is uh, very much like the military. There's a blend of uh, luck and skill, and so I count myself very lucky to have been selected. Everyone that was in the interviewees uh, rounds with me, I would have picked over myself, honestly. Um, the way I th think about it is, uh, you know, uh, just like the military, they put us in situations where we're not quite ready for it, and they do that expecting that we may fail, um, and that's fine, and, and move on and, and, and learn from it as long as we learn and continue to move. I think the other thing I rely on is my family. Uh, that helps ground me, and, uh, and at the end of the day, that's probably the most important thing to me. So, um, you know, if I am ever feeling nervous or worried about things, uh, just going home always resets me. Hello. I am Cadet Arjun Coley, Class of 2023 from Columbus, Ohio. And my question is, what was the most unexpected event during your career as an astronaut? Arjun, I think my most unexpected uh, thing was actually getting selected to fly a mission. And so after uh, ASCAN training, uh, you know, we do what we call, uh, it's kind of like doing attached jobs in the military, in the Air Force or Space Force, where you're doing a, a day job. And I was really enjoying that and didn't expect to fly for, for years, honestly. And so when I got the call that I was going to get assigned to fly in Crew 3, that was probably the most surprising moment the time I've been at NASA. Hello, I'm Cadet First Class David Garcia from Rock Hill, South Carolina, and my question is on Astrobeat. Being the free-flying system on the International Space Station designed to do the routine, monotonous tasks for astronauts, are there any new breakthroughs for either hardware or software to date? Yeah, thanks for uh, asking, uh, David. So you're right, we've got three, uh, three astrobees up here, uh, Honey, Bumble, and Queen. And I'd say ma the majority of it is what I would call breakthrough. It's we're trying to uh, make them do tasks that are uh, easy for them to do, whether it's uh, inventory, looking for lost items, searching for things. I'd say one of the newer technologies that we just looked at last week, Kayla, uh, my classmate up here and crewmate, uh, was looking at, at a sound technology where they're basically looking for off nominal indications based on the sounds of the machinery. And so if they can detect early failures from like a fan noise, uh, computer sound, things like that. So that's a, a newer thing we're trying out with them. Hello, I'm Cadet McCollum, class of 23 from Newcastle, Pennsylvania. My question is, what research or extracurricular activities were you involved in at USAFA that helped you get to where you are today? Uh, so, Joseph, when I was there, uh, I was pretty heavily involved in the FalconSat program, um, getting that uh, off the ground, so to speak. Uh, and so that was probably the biggest uh, extracurricular thing I was involved in, especially my uh, uh, two and first uh, two degree and first year. Um, I think just generally, too, the leadership experience, I think coming into the academy, I didn't necessarily buy the line that you could teach leadership. I thought you either had it or you didn't. But I think my experience at the academy and then the military afterward has made me a full-time believer uh, that what the academy is doing is, is, is the right path. You can teach it. Um, there are a lot of lessons to be learned, trust me. Uh, and I, I think that's one of the biggest things involvement-wise at the academy that uh, led to success later. 
Hi, I'm Sue and C. Mickey Donahue. I'm in Cadet Squadron 14, and I'm from Grand Ledge, Michigan. My question for you is, what is one thing that you're not allowed to do on the International Space Station that you wish you could? Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I could get in trouble for this. Uh, let's see. Um, there's a few things that aren't necessarily practical. I'd love to have my wife and kids up here uh, to see from time to time um, or every day would be great. Uh, I think after that, maybe an adult beverage at the end of the week would be a nice thing to have. Uh, from a practical standpoint, uh, things that wouldn't get me in trouble uh, would be basically the ability to throw things out. And so we have a, trying to manage the logistics of trash is a really big problem. Uh, and so if we could have some way to heave it out and launch it somewhere that's not here, that would be a thing I would love to have on the space station. Hi, my name is Captain Megan Quadrino, and I'm an instructor at the Department of Astronautics at the United States Air Force Academy. And I was wondering if you could talk about how your experience at the Air Force Academy and within the Astro major in particular helped to prepare you for the challenges ahead and specifically in becoming an astronaut. Yeah, Megan, I say it a little, um, that's a makes me think about, takes me back many, many years back to the Astro Department. I think one of the things I've fallen back on many times uh, and many experiences after the Academy is I legitimately think the Academy was the hardest thing I did. Uh, you know, four years of a grueling pace and, you know, many times after that, uh, whether it was pilot training, uh, test pilot school, uh, grad school, you know, astronaut training, many times I've looked back and said, if I can make it through four years of sleep deprivation, multitasking and never having enough time to do anything, I can definitely make it through uh, shorter periods of time. I'm doing these hard things. And so I think that's something that's always fallen back on. Uh, I think my involvement in the Astro Department, um, you know, is uh, the, the, the attention to detail um, and the, the, the engineering discipline and having to think through problems. Um, I think that's been beneficial. Clearly, there's, you know, having an astronautics background and being an astronaut, that's beneficial in and of itself. Um, I think the other thing uh, that I look back on and think about that I didn't recognize at the time at the Academy was you get a lot of practice uh, that's really useful in both the military civilian world and here at NASA is you know every semester you change jobs there and it's very similar to what ha happens in high performing organizations here at NASA is very similar and so you know one semester you may have a different you may be in charge of someone and the next semester you're uh, a peer or following them and that's a very similar scenario at NASA uh, in a lot of workplaces um, or small teams in the military where the function of the team drives who's in charge at different times and you have to very quickly be able to go between being a leader, being a follower, being a peer and that's something that's really important from a team cohesion and execution standpoint every day on the station in fact you know depending on the tasks going on it's, it's always a blend of, of skills and so that's something I think the Academy taught me without me even knowing it. Well what a memorable experience for our institution. Thank you again. And if you can see us from up there, pay no attention to that large burn mark on the terrazzo grass. It's a long story. Happy New Year. Thanks very much, General Bogan. Uh, you're probably wondering why these patches are all in a plastic bag, because if I took all 40 out, they'd explode all over the lab. Uh, and I've also got uh, a gold ingot flying up here for your guys' future class rings. So just like mine had a, a piece of uh, gold melted in from space, so you guys got one on the way eventually. So it's great talking to you, and go Falcons. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you to all participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio comms.